everyone. Uh, welcome to DjangoCon. My name is Nina Zakarenko. I work for Reddit. And uh, we've been using this stack pretty extensively on our internal tools. And it's worked out really well for us. Um, to show of hands, how many of you guys write JavaScript? No JavaScript? Awesome. Fair amount of you. Um, so I made a kind of a little sample app that goes through all the concepts that we've we're going to be discussing. So if you guys want to clone that, um, I'll be going through a lot of code that's uh, in this app. And you guys can follow along. So kind of doing this a little bit differently. I think this will be a little bit more fun. So <laughs> Django templates are not my favorite. They're, yeah, deal with it. <laughs> Don't mean to offend anyone here, but it's my point of view. So, you know, they're, they're kind of really slow. If you want to submit a form, you have to wait for the whole page to refresh. Template tags are kind of hard to understand. If you forget to end one, your, you know, your stuff is broken. It's, it can be hard to debug. It's difficult to unit test. And if you're actually working with a front-end dev, sometimes it's kind of difficult for them to pick up the template tags without knowing Python. And, you know, and tags are pretty annoying. Uh, so forms get complex really fast. You kind of sprinkle in a little validation logic over here and, you know, abuse some template logic over there, and all of a sudden, you know, would you like meatballs with your spaghetti? Um, so, in my humble opinion, why endpoints are better? They're faster. Uh, you can have a single page app. You don't have to wait for the whole thing to reload. You can swap JavaScript frameworks pretty easily. There's, you know, a whole slew of them out there. And once you have your endpoints set up, they're reusable. So. Let's say you want to write a native mobile app. Well, you know, your back end's already there. So that's pretty awesome. And you can dog food. So if your endpoints are public, you can use them internally, kind of work out all the kinks, see what's working, see what isn't. Um, you'll be the first one to find out if there are any problems. So that's really a, a huge benefit. Um, the other nice thing is that REST frameworks are standard. So, you know, if you have any front end dev, chances are that they've already seen this, they've worked with this kind of structure, it's easy for them to understand. It's nothing new and they can get started right away. So, if you need a JavaScript framework, why not Angular? Um, there's tons of benefits to Angular. It's uh, an MVC framework. The responsibilities are separated, uh, single page app, no refreshes, uh, much better user experience. And the scope is this magical thing. Uh, it's a way to, to bind variables between your front end and your controller. So no jQuery, no crazy JavaScript magic. You set a variable on your scope, and it's accessible in the template. Uh, Angular is also very easily unit tested, um, much better, I think, than kind of comparing, you know, in your unit test, does my HTML match what I expect it to? It's kind of hard to be dynamic when you're doing that. So <laughs> the bad, you have to use JavaScript. Uh, it kind of seems like a bunch of you already do, so that's good. But uh, I overheard in the elevator the other day, someone's like, I don't like JavaScript. It's just too many curly braces and semicolons. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good reason not to like JavaScript. <laughs> so, I, you know, obviously other languages are not as elegant as Python, but it's the language of the web. It's not going anywhere. You'd be doing yourself a really great disservice uh, avoiding learning it because you don't like the way it looks. So. Sorry to call you out, random elevator person, but <laughs> it's truth. 
Um, so if you don't like Angular in particular, it's pretty easy to just swap out to another JavaScript framework. You got React, and you got Ember, and you got Backbone. Um, and who knows what's coming next? So they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, a great talk about that is uh, my coworker, Brian Holt. He did a presentation about choosing a JavaScript framework, uh, what the strengths and weaknesses are. So uh, if you guys can't read that, that's http brianholt.me. Um, and I definitely recommend that you read it. It's one of those funky reveal JS presentations, so just make sure you hit the down arrow uh, if the presentation seems a little bit short. So um, I put up that GitHub code link earlier. Uh, here it is again for anyone who missed it. We're gonna go ahead and use all the concepts that we're learning today to build a tweeter app. Um, our requirements are pretty short. Probably won't be seeing this you know, out in the wild pretty often, <laughs> but uh, we want to display a list of tweets for all users. Uh, we want to narrow down that list and only get the tweets for uh, the logged in user. And then we also want to show the profile for that logged in user. And it doesn't take a ton of code to get this all together. It's actually uh, pretty impressive. So uh, the endpoints that I'm using are created with Django REST framework. Uh, it's pretty easy to create a REST endpoint for your application. I don't know if any of you were at my talk yesterday, but I kind of explore that in more detail. But for those of you looking at the code, uh, the beef of the DRF stuff is in serializers.py and permissions.py, and then the routing is done in urls.py. So here's our model. It's uh, pretty simple. We have a foreign key to user, because we want to know who made the tweet. We have a regular uh, chart field for the text and a timestamp of when the tweet was created. This one? Oh, um, this should be on. Yeah. Oh, sorry. How about I do this? Does that help? <laughs> I'm just going to talk to you all like this now. All right. Let me mess with this. Because we're going to have to deal with the static while I do. About that? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to shout. Or I can look on the Um, sure. Yeah. How's that? Right. Testing, testing. Good? Okay. I'm gonna take this contraption off then and turn it off. Can everyone hear me now? Yeah, awesome, all right. Um, you know, just because people couldn't hear me, could you raise your hands and ask if there are any concepts you'd like me to re-explain? Y'all good, all right. So our, our endpoints are gonna look like this. They're really simple. We have an uh, endpoint to fetch all the users, an endpoint to fetch uh, just one user, an endpoint to fetch all the tweets, and then an endpoint to fetch a tweet by ID. So when we call our tweets endpoint, this is the kind of uh, response we're gonna get. It's just a list of JSON tweets that contain uh, the fields that we've defined in our Django REST framework serializer.
Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is configuring Angular for Django. There are definitely a few gotchas that you need to be aware of um, when you're using it you know, right off the bat. So the first thing you need to do is fetch an Angular file and include it in your template. Um, for my mini project, I just fetched it and uh, you know, put it in a local lib folder, but it's uh, best to use CDN. If there are any updates, you kind of get them automatically. You don't have to you know, worry about maintaining yet another library. And uh, the way we enable our front end to be Angular is by using an ng app tag. Uh, can everyone see the bottom of the screen? Yeah, okay. So um, the, the most common place you would put it is in the HTML uh, or the body. But if you only want you know, some little part of your app to be Angular, you can even throw it in a div. So really flexible. Uh, I called my Angular app Twitter app. So very creative and original. So, uh oh, <laughs> Angular tags and Django template tags conflict. They're both double curly braces, and that's kind of a problem. If you just try to throw some Angular on your Django page, some things are going to barf and not very pretty. So the way to get around that is either to tell Angular to use a different kind of tag. So, uh, for example, I like using a double square brackets. Or uh, you can use the Django template verbatim tag. So I very much prefer the first way, because if you go the second route, you're just going to have tons of chunks of verbatim tags all over your template. Um, it gets messy. Uh, not really great, but it's an option for you if you want to use it. So this is how we tell Angular to use a different kind of bracket. It's actually a you know, really great feature that they've provided this, and we have options. The second thing we want to configure is our C CSRF tokens. So uh, if you read the Django docs on Ajax, they'll, they'll tell you to do this. So you need to tell Angular that you know, this is what the CRF tokens are, this is what they're called, and then on your, in your Django views, you want to use ensure CSRF token to make sure that um, to make sure that that token is generated even if the CSRF token tag is not present in the template. So kind of handy and, and cleaner, and I think it's a lot more explicit too. You know, when you're looking at the view, if not all your views are CSRF protected by middleware, you know which ones are. Um, you know which ones are going to be passing that token uh, back. The next important thing in our configuration file is we want to tell Angular to stop stripping trailing tr uh, slashes. So I don't know why it does that, but that's not really uh, that doesn't really work with Django because Django loves trailing slashes. They're everywhere. Um, so uh, this is actually a new feature in Angular 3. So be mindful of that. If you're using an older version of Angular, there's some kind of hacky ways to get around it. Um, you have to add on a trailing slash that's escaped in a string. And then you can't use some of that Angular magic where it kind of can guess what your endpoints are structured like based on Rust. Uh, and you have to do a little bit more configuration on the Angular side as well. <clears throat> so this is what uh, an Angular resource looks like. It's a, it's a factory that lets you create a resource object and uh, based off a REST endpoint and interact with it really simply. Uh, so to kind of walk through the code, tweeterapp.services is what my services module is called. And then um, ng-resource is actually a separate 
JavaScript include that you have to be mindful of because it's not part of uh, the core Angular code. And here we define a factory that's based on our tweets. Uh, so when we create an object called tweet in JavaScript land, it, it's aware of this URL. And there's some kind of magical binding going on. So here are some of the default actions you get with the Angular resource. Um, you kind of get all those HTTP verbs. It's aware of uh, get. So if you have an ID defined in your resource, uh, like I did here, so uh, there's that, uh, the, I don't know, what, what is that symbol called? The two, two dots, colon? Colon, yes. So uh, colon ID is kind of uh, an important thing to note there because when you use this kind of built-in method, you call get, it knows that an ID is expected. And so when you pass one in, Angular knows that you're getting a single resource, it's an object, uh, it kind of does magic and transforms it to be that way. Whereas when you call query, it knows to expect a collection and it's gonna call the root of that endpoint without the ID. Does that make sense to everyone? See some nods? No nods? Yeah, all right. So here's how we would create a new object. It's really simple. Uh, it's not quite as messy as something like jQuery Ajax. Um, so we called our resource tweet. We can just call new tweet, set some properties on it, and call save. And that's Angular magic for you. It's pretty awesome. So there are two ways to interact with these resources. The first way uh, is callbacks. I'm sure many of you have heard of or experienced callback hell. It's out there. Uh, uh, so when you call uh, tweet.get and you pass in an ID, if, there's, if that's kind of it, what you're going to get back is a, it's, it's a promise. So you don't, you, you don't get anything back right away. You kind of have to know when the server has responded and then do something with that data. So uh, here's the callback format. We're passing in a function. Uh, we're taking in a tweet, and then we can do stuff with that object once uh, that server has returned. The newer way of doing this is, um, it's called promises. They're much cleaner code, uh, in my opinion. You can chain them. Uh, so instead of passing, uh, passing in a callback function, you instead call dot promise then, and then your function that gets called when that uh, data is returned is there. And you can chain these promises. So this promise only takes care of a successful request. Uh, if there's an error, you should chain another promise on and then you'll get that error code back and the status and you can do something with that. Uh, so for example, if it's not authorized, you know, display the correct message to the user. So the scope is, like I mentioned earlier, really my favorite thing about Angular. Um, it's, I like to call it outer magical. You change something in your controller, it's uh, displayed on the front end right away. You change something you know, on your front end in your template and it's there in the controller. Magic. Magic. That's how I felt when I first learned about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's move on to controllers. Our the syntax for creating one is kind of similar to how you would uh, create a resource. So here, tweet CTRL is the name of our controller. And uh, we call a function, but an important thing to note here is that these are dependencies. So by passing in these arguments, we're telling the controller that we need a handle on scope, and we also need a handle on tweet. And that's our, that resource that we created. So now we can freely use it in the controller. 
Oops. And then that's the... So here's the meat of our controller. Um, we have our query function, and that satisfies our first requirement of wanting to get all the tweets that exist. Um, here you see I'm calling uh, using a callback, and when that query returns, we want to set scoped up tweets to the response. So as soon as this function is done, they pop up. The other thing, uh, the other function in our controller is used to submit a tweet. So we use that same syntax that we saw. We create a new tweet. Um, we pass in the data that was uh, in that input box. And then we call save on it. And the last thing that we do is pop that tweet right onto the top of our stack of current tweets, and it's displayed right away. So fortunately, you can't get rid of all the Django templates. You need one. Uh, it allows you to pass information back and forth from Django land to Angular land. Uh, it lets us know what the static URL path is, uh, <clears throat> is so that we can include those files. It's, it's kind of useful, so can't get rid of it. Um, here's an example of how you would pass uh, some template data back into Angular. It's a little bit hacky, but it works. We actually throw this on our base template page, and it instantiates a quick and dirty little service um, I call it auth user, and it kind of runs a piece of code on the page and display, uh, returns that result. So we can uh, actually go into the Django user and get some uh, useful information back from it, in this case, the ID. Uh, I'm not sure where I found this hack, but it's actually been really useful, so whoever the author is, thank you. So this is how we do UI routing in Angular. Instead of using Django templates, we're going to be using partials. Uh, there's a lot going on on this page. So let's kind of go through it one by one. And uh, the first thing that we know is uh, that URL provider, the default, that's the default route. So if someone tries to type in a bunch of stuff, in that URL bar, they're just going to get kicked back to here. Um, the URL is what that URL will look like to the user. The template URL is where that partial is stored. Um, and the controller is kind of the important bit. That lets you know, that lets Angular know which controller to associate to which template. There is a different way of doing it that's similar to ng app. Um, you can throw that controller into uh, any HTML tag, but I find this way to be much cleaner. All your controllers are defined in one place. Uh, you instantly know where they're getting called. So, routing in Angular is pretty simple. You drop UI view into a div anywhere on your page, and that's where the partials are going to be dropped in. So. It, it's a lot different than something that include because it's also aware of state. Uh, you can pass variables back and forth. You can use them as conditionals. So very powerful. Um, yeah, your partials are just vanilla HTML and Angular. No Django necessary. Uh, I like to keep them in an accessible static folder. Yes? What's a partial? Um, I can show you guys one. Is it short for something more descriptive? No. Let's look at some code. If we can reserve our questions for the end of the talk, this way she can just.
Okay, I'll have to show it to you guys afterwards. Chrome full screen does not want to give up. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't include any information about testing in this talk. I wasn't sure if I would have time, but test all the things. Do it. It's just so much easier and nicer. The Angular documentation is pretty good. My, my experience with it, you know, there, there are some cons. The biggest one to me was um, when you get an error in your Angular code, it's pretty indecipherable. Indecipherable. Excuse me. Um, it's you know all anonymous functions and callbacks and you something happens and you're just like what? <laughs> but it, it kind of figuring out what's going wrong comes with experience. So just keep at it. Don't get too frustrated. Um, use that debugger command. Uh, sorry, debugger statement in in your JavaScript. Uh, if you have Chrome DevTools open, it'll just stop there. Use, you know, use prints. They're okay. We all use them. It's, uh, it's okay to admit it. Uh, so, demo time. Crossing my fingers, because this didn't go so well the last time. But I'm going to show you guys my Twitter app in action. Here it is in all of its glory. Uh, here we have all the tweets from all of our users. They're really cool and creative. We all want to read them. And here's our My Tweets view. Boom, it's so fast. Such a nice user experience. Um, no page reload, it's pretty instantaneous. And it doesn't, you know, even when you have a ton of data, it's not super bogged down. And here we have our, our profile view. So I know I'm a great web designer. Thank you guys very much. But the, the cool thing that I want to look at is, uh, let's see if I type that right. Yeah. Here's our, our Django Rust framework, Browsable API. This is awesome. Definitely one of the uh, features that I love most about it. It's super easy to use. Um, for example, here's a drop down. Um, oops, what is that? Yeah, demo time. Uh, we can call options and kind of see what's available on our API. Um, here, it, this is the root. So from here, we can kind of navigate down look at our tweets, we get a tweet list. So here we can see all the data that's coming back to Angular. Uh, we can also submit data back. So we can either do it from raw data or HTML. I have a, or an HTML form actually, which is really nice. So I, I have a validator set in place that's gonna return an error if my tweet is less than five characters. Um, I get a bad request with the error message that I specified. Django Rose framework is also really smart. So I have a model field that is only 140 characters. So see if I put a bunch of text in here, I always feel like I'm, you know, doing this. Um, oops, not long enough. Let's see. <laughs> Here, I have a better idea. Copy and paste. We'll get another bad request. I can't see this on my screen, so I'm just gonna assume everything is going great. Yeah. Um, so let's kind of, let's go back to our API route. And uh, take a quick look at our user's endpoint. So here's where we, oh, there we go. Look at my awesome tweet. Here's uh, where we get back all of our users, properties about them, first name, last name, username, 
and then a collection of all their tweets. So this was super easy to create. Google Drive. The internet was down earlier today, so that was definitely very, very nerve-wracking. But um, just put that up. That's uh, it for my presentation. Feel free to find me afterwards if you have questions. I love to talk about the stuff, and I hope you guys enjoyed my talk.